Let's open our Bibles to First Peter. <clears throat> Last week I did an introduction on this book. <clears throat> and remember the question I started with? Well, it wasn't really a question, it was a quote, an old Roman quote. While there is life, there is hope. And although that is correct, it's not complete and completely correct because it is not just hope in hope, it is hope in something that's substantial. And last week we're looking at this book, at First Peter, and uh, what uh, uh, how Peter, you know the, the, the what Peter says is our hope. Is, uh, we can see it there in verse one, chapter one, verse three. It says, "Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope." by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, those Christians could have, uh, if Jesus Christ did not resurrect, they could have had hope on Jesus Christ, but if he, if he stayed in the grave, uh, that wasn't really a wise thing to do. And so Peter, immediately after he introduces himself, and he tells us that he's an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, tells us the theme of this letter. Anybody remember the theme or the main, um, uh, yeah, the, the main theme of the book of Colossians? We, we, it, took, it took us almost a year and a half to go through that book, but we saw something there that goes throughout all five verses, or five chapters. What is Colossians about? Colossians. We are complete in Him. This is the whole thing. We don't need anything added. He's he, played, he can perfectly um, fill every need that we have. And here in this book of First Peter, as we saw last week, it has to do with a living hope. Jesus is our living hope. And I'm not going to go through the, the, the introduction again, some of you are not here. But just so that you know where we're going with this, the whole book is only five chapters. But I've, I've divided it in three topics. Uh, verses chapter 1 as soon as he opens and verse 3 all the way to chapter 2 verse 10 he talks about God's enablement God's grace in salvation and he talks to us about, and tells us that all three the Godhead Father, Son and Holy Spirit were involved in that salvation and uh, he tells us what, uh, how he chose to bring that salvation about which was through the sanctification of the Holy Spirit through uh, the truth that God had, so we'll get into that later on and we have a living hope and we have a live we um, uh, we are supposed to, supposed to be living in holiness and we are supposed to be living in harmony this is a uh, what chapters 1 through chapter 2 covers and then he covers another topic very similar to what we saw in Colossians about submission remember we covered that it starts with husbands um, love your wives wives submit to your husbands then he goes to the children, to the workers, and so on. And so Peter's going to echo that and he talks about where we can get the ability to be able to submit to the authorities, how we are able to submit to those that we work with, and how we are able to submit in the home and in the church, even though the people we have to submit to are not easy to deal with. And then I think the most difficult thing, you think this is all is difficult, he gets into chapter 3, verse 13. He starts about, talks about the grace and suffering. How many of us here this afternoon can raise their hand and say, I'm, I'm pretty graceful when it comes to suffering. When things are looking south, when things on the bucket, the, 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 end, you know, the, the bottom of the bucket is about to fall off and everything seems like it's going to go out of control. And we just uh, uh, saw the, the example with Joe. When things just start going completely against us, not because... Uh, we have made stupid decisions, but because we've made wise decisions, because we decided to follow Christ, are we able to respond with joy? Uh, this is going to be uh, difficult. You say, where do I get that joy when I'm trying to live for the Lord and trying to give witness, I'm kind of trying to show people that Jesus Christ is truly the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Anointed One, the Living Savior, and when I give testimony about him, uh, and, and people respond with, uh, in a very negative, very um, 
you know, with mocking and even with insult. Are you able to sit, step back and say, Lord, thank you very much. I can, I'm in good company. Um, you said that uh, if they hated you, they would also hate us if we followed you. Are we able to uh, um, have, you know, uh, have joy in suffering? So this whole chapter, this whole book, uh, First Peter, has to do with how to respond in moments, in times when adversity, when persecution takes place. And the, and the book uh, opens up uh, this way. Let's look at the first few verses. And this afternoon, all I want to do is concentrate in two words, the first two that we see, verse 1. But let's just read all three verses. Uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the immediately you see who is writing to. The writer is Peter, and he writes to strangers. Not strangers to him, but strangers in this world that do not belong to them. And where are these strangers? They're scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And uh, if you look uh, further down, uh, further into the book in chapter 4, you can see the, the topic that is going to be covering throughout the book. Uh, look with me real fast to chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Beloved, think it not strange according, uh, concerning the fiery, notice it's not just trials, is describing the, the intensity of these trials by saying they are fiery trials, which is to, uh, to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Uh, so how would you respond to these fiery trials? Verse 13, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, then that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be able also, now notice another adjective introduced there. First, is you can have joy in suffering, but then when you see him in glory, you will have exceeding joy. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of, uh, of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on you, on your part, he is glorified. And so the whole book, as we go through the book, we'll see uh, how Peter says, listen, I remember this Peter, as we as I mentioned last week, this is not the same, it's the same individual, but much more mature. Uh, first Peter is written more or less in the year 65, according to um, history scholars. And uh, which means that this is about 30 some years after the Lord has resurrected. Uh, this individual, we, we, uh, this, this name we find here, Peter, the Apostle of Jesus Christ, is a man who has been tried in every possible way and came through victoriously. And he tells us the secret in this book. And so it makes him the perfect individual to write this letter through. Let's have a word of prayer again and ask the Lord to bless us and help us capture the meaning of this book. Dear Heavenly Father, we come again before you. We understand that we don't really understand fully. And as we open this book, we will see that the one writing this book, and then his position, and then who he represents. And everything after this, Lord, hinges around this truth. Who is Jesus Christ? True. Lord, this afternoon I pray that you will help me in, um, unveil a little bit more who this individual, Peter, was, especially at this point in his life, so that later on when we move into the book, we will see why he is the perfect candidate through which Christ and the Holy Spirit will write these words to those who are persecuted. Help us, dear Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So who's the writer? 
Watch out, I'm tricking you, because if you read at the end of this epistle, you find the same thing that you, that you see in some of the epistles of the Apostle Paul. It's not the actual pen-on-paper writer. He has somebody assisting him. We will get into that later on. But we do know that it is the Holy Spirit giving this individual we know as Peter, Petros, these very important words. He's a representative, he says he's an apostle of none other than Jesus Christ. Now this morning I made an, an, an illustration. I said, how many of you, uh, we have quite a few Venezuelan um, brethren here, said, how many of you have said, hey, I'm a representative of um, Maduro, the, pre the, the actual uh, dictator, uh, autocrat, as they call him, uh, of Venezuela. I have a message for you. If you've ever heard any of his messages, he's so full of himself. He's just, uh, he will invent anything and believe it. Now, everybody, all those from Venezuela started uh, smiling and some of them started even laughing. In other words, we don't care what Maduro has to say because he has no authority over us. But if you say, I am an apostle, I'm a, I'm a sent one, I am one who is sent out by the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you would say, whoa, hold on a second, the words that this individual has is coming from none other than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We need to pay attention. So as Paul opens this epistle, he is presenting himself as Peter. Now you're ready because all we're going to do this afternoon is talk about this name. Who is this it, Peter? Well, he we, he describes himself as an apostle, which means, a, in general terms, he was being sent as an agent on a mission. At this precise moment, God is in heaven, and he's thinking, and he's seeing how his, the believers from, from Jerusalem, both Jews and Gentiles, have been scattered because of their uh, testimony for Christ. They're all over the world. They've lost just about everything they own. They don't that maybe tomorrow they'll be having to move to another place because they'll be being persecuted. And God is saying, who am I going to send as a messenger to these individuals? And he's thinking, he's going through his register, and he thinks, well, let me see, maybe I can send Paul. He's a good representative, but he's more a, um, an apostle to the Gentiles. Well, then let me continue. He goes through, and he, and he comes to Peter and says, yep, yep, this is the perfect individual to bring this letter across. And we will understand why God chose Peter to write this epistle. But as we move on, an apostle also means he was being sent as an agent on a mission, having been personally commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you, and raise your hand if you agree with me, believe that this epistle, like the rest of the Bible, was inspired by the Holy Spirit? How many of you don't believe that this is inspired by the Holy Spirit? Well, I hope you all do, because the Bible tells us that all Scripture is inspired by God, by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that every word in this epistle is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And when Peter receives it, he receives it as a message from God Himself, a message that these individuals who are going through terrible difficulty, they need the Word, they need they need encouragement. They're at the bottom of the bottom, and they're thinking, maybe, remember uh, John the Baptist at one point when he was put in prison? He started having doubts. Mm -hmm. Well, this is not exactly what I had scheduled. This is not what I had in plan. I, I was presenting Jesus, but here I am in jail. It doesn't seem to be complying with my agenda with what I thought he'd be doing. So I'll send somebody to ask him if he is the one who will be sent the Messiah or not. And Jesus responds, says, don't be offended. And then he answers to him in just very simple terms, I am the one. But everything, when everything was turning, was going south, everything was, you know, like, where is God when you need him? Have you ever been in a situation where you know, uh, everything is falling apart. Like Job, you know, his family just, he loses his kids. His, he, he loses his, his wealth. He loses everything. He loses his, his health. And you, at that moment, you're wondering, well, uh, Lord, where, 
Do you, uh, are you concerned? Do you, do you really care about my situation? And in chapter 1 and chapter 2, you find, actually after chapter 2, you see that even Job, with the tremendous faith that he had, it started collapsing. And as you move into the book of Job, you find there around chapter 30, something like that, where he's praying his way, you know, in every direction, not south, not north, south, east, west, and he's not getting any answer. When God keeps silence, how do you deal with that? And, and Job, you know, dealt with, you could deal with just about anything and handle it. But he couldn't handle God's silence. And there will be times in your life when you feel like, you know, here I am trying to live for the Lord, and the more I try to stay faithful, the more hits I get. The more everything seems to be turning sour. And you pray, and God doesn't seem, not that He's not there, not that He doesn't, He's not concerned, but it doesn't seem like He's really um, interested in you. So as we open this book, we, uh, uh, Peter is he's writing these individuals who have lost everything. They're, they've lost their homes. They've lost their family. They've lost their friends. They've lost just about everything. They're scattered abroad like seed. And he's, trying to, and he's writing to them, trying to give them hope. And then you would think, hold on a second. Are you sure that Peter will be the, 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 the adequate candidate? Now just think of Peter. If you go into your time machine and go 30 years back, what do you see about Peter? Oh, I, I think God chose Peter because he was a success. Everything that he did was um, ideal. He was the, I mean, he was a, a man of, of, of true success. Never denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Always stayed faithful. He, he, uh, he was uh, faithful to the end. And you know, you would hear the bell. No, it isn't. He isn't that individual. So why should we believe this individual now, trying to give us hope? And you will see through the letter that he is a perfect individual because he says, you know, I failed in every possible way that anybody can fail, but God didn't give up on me. And now he's presenting himself, he's presenting his credentials, he says, I am an apostle, a sent one from God himself. Well, you think, well, the Lord surely knew better, he would have chosen somebody else. Somebody that people could really trust, because it seems like everything that Peter did, um, he represents failure in just about every way. And he presents his, uh, he says, I'm an ambassador. I'm an ambassador of Jesus Christ, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they first knew Jesus as Jesus the man, but they came to understand that he was, uh, he was God incarnate, their living Messiah, the Christ. So by the time Peter writes this, this letter, Jesus and Christ have become inseparable names of our Lord Jesus Christ. More than just a name, what you have here is a creed. It's a faith statement. When he says, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the, the Jesus meaning Joshua, God saves the anointed one. He's saying, listen, the, the reason why I can tell you that you can have living hope is because he lives. And I saw him resurrected. He's giving a, uh, what I would call more of a, a faith statement, a, a declaration of faith, more than a name. Now, it is interesting that the Apostle Paul is the only writer to ever reverse this order. If you ever pay attention to that, I looked into this, and out of 180 references to Jesus, in Paul's epistles, Paul will refer to him as Christ Jesus 58, 55 times. Paul refers to Jesus Christ as Christ Jesus, but Peter here is saying Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's just, uh, that's just a coincidence. That's really not, not really important. I don't think 
It's just a coincidence. I think there's a reason for this because in the case of the apostles, they knew Jesus first by his name. It was a common thing to come across people in his time with the name Yeshua. We have several. Uh, in fact, in the book of Colossians, um, uh, uh, Paul mentions one, uh, Jesus el Justo, Jesus the, the, the just, uh, and he's talking about an individual, not Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a common thing. We have the book in the Old Testament, we have uh, Joshua, that's the same name, Yeshua, Jesus saves. It was a common thing to uh, name uh, individuals in that time uh, with this name, Yeshua. But here Peter is, is saying, this is not just an ordinary, just one more Jesus, Yeshua, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christos, the, the, the anointed one. But Paul reverses it and he says, no, no, he's the Christos Jesus. And I think the reason for that, that change is because the apostles first knew Jesus as Jesus. Uh, one that would probably uh, liberate them from the oppression of Rome, from the oppressors. And then later on when Jesus Christ resurrected, that's when they knew, knew him as Kurios, as the true anointed one. But in the case of, Je uh, of the Apostle Paul, remember, on his way to Damascus, he comes across this um, incredible light that knocks him off his horse, he's on the ground, and he asks, who are you? Kurios, Lord, not just a Lord of many, but the Lord of Lords, who are you, God? He's really pointing out to the Lord Jesus, the, to that, well, the one that's speaking through that light, he's referring to him as God, and then who are you, Kurios, who are you, Lord? And then he said, the answer is, I am Jesus, I am the Jesus, or Jehovah says, who are you are persecuting, and this broke, it broke something inside the Apostle Paul that had him thinking for several days. The answers to that question, or to that uh, answer, what do you want me to do, Lord? But he, and remember, he was taken, he couldn't, he couldn't see, he was blinded, he was, he was, he was taken into the Damascus, into a, a street called La Derecha, or the right, and uh, there he was like having a brainstorm, thinking, what just happened? What, what, exactly, where am I now? I mean, I mean, I was taught in, I was one of the outstanding students in the school of Gamaliel, which was a, a man who was venerated in Israel as a teacher. And uh, Paul, uh, Saul of Tarso, uh, Saul of Tarsus, was number one student. And uh, now he is number one Pharisee, and he's really zealous of following the Lord and doing what God uh, wants him to do. And of course, this. These guys, these guys who call themselves Christians, they're blasphemous, really. They're, they're saying that that individual called Jesus, or Jesus, Je Jesus, is God himself. We can't tolerate that. We can have that being spread around. And he does everything in his power to get letters to go and persecute the Christians, to stop them from spreading what he considered absolute blasphemy. And now he is in his room, brainstorming, thinking, how could I have, how could I have been so wrong? Jesus is, maybe he's going through the, the time when he, as a young lad, was holding the, the clothes of Stephen. Uh, uh, or was it Philip? I can't remember the name. Stephen. And had him stoned. And then later, going through all those families that he tore apart by arresting many of those Christians. He's going through that thinking, what made them persevere in such difficult situation? Thinking at the same time, how could I be so wrong? It's, he, it, it, immediately after uh, Ananias came to him and, and touched him and, uh, and um, a scale fell from his eyes. He, the Bible tells us, if you turn your Bibles, please, to um, um, Acts chapter 4. <clears throat> we see the Apostle Paul immediately 
preaching Christ. And he says there in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none, no other name under heaven given upon among men whereby we must be saved. Immediately after that, he Peter, Paul was, you know, he was openly sharing this message, even giving response, giving arguments that Jesus Christ was truly who he said he was, the Messiah. His life had been transformed by what Peter is saying here, Jesus Christus. Understanding that, listen friend, this is where it hits home. If we understand truly who Jesus Christ is, if we truly understand our lives will be transformed. We, it wouldn't be God second in my plans, it will be God first in my plans. The Lord Jesus Christ will be centered in everything that we do. It is certainly centered in this man that introduces this epistle. He says, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, remember that Peter, throughout the three years of ministry, while he walked with the Lord Jesus Christ, he just, uh, he was, some, some commentators say that, Collins say that he had an arm in the shape of a foot. And the only the only time that he would open his mouth is to let the other foot in, because he would be always messing up. He was the kind of guy that would always speak up and be wrong about the things that he was saying. And so here Peter is coming through as I am being sent by the Lord Jesus Christ, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and. By this he's saying Jesus is still the Lord of the cosmos, of all creation, the only Messiah able to save mankind. He is indeed Jesus, Savior, and not just any one called Jesus, but he is the Christ, the anointed one. So friends, what is it that is becoming more and more offensive to our challenging world? It is when we say there is no self, there is only one name given unto man under heaven by which we are saved. By saying that only Jesus saves, you're making a very radical statement and people tend to be offended. If you say this in, in any, by the way, let me just give you my own personal example. I was called by Kudeka one time. They were trying to open up to the patients of the people that could minister to them, minister to them in that in those last moments of their life. So they called, they called the priest of the town, they called the um, the Buddhist uh, representative of the um, um, uh, of this temple, Buddhist temple that we have here in Arroyo. They had. They also would call the pastor from the Jehovah's Witness um, assembly and the called a, the representative of the Anglican Church here in England, and they called me. And they wanted us to, uh, to tell us that, you know, in case any of the patients, they can be of any denomination, that if we, if we would be available. And of course, I was available. They called me. I'd be more than willing to help somebody who are dealing with, you know, at the end of their life. And I remember the lady asking very kindly, very, very respectful, and what would you have to offer in a situation like that. And this is where it got interesting. I was the last one to be asked. And they asked the, the lady then that was representative of the Buddhist temple, and uh, she gave her answer. Well, we would be there to help them out, understand that we are just a part of the, everything. And you know, just gave her answer very, it was almost like having hope in hope. It didn't come through very well. And then they asked the Anglican lady, who was supposed to be the pastor, and they said, what about you? What would you be, uh, how would you respond to a situation like this? And she again was very kind and uh, tried to uh, share her heart. She said, well, we would sit by the patient, hold their hand and tell them to hold on and be hopeful and try to encourage them in those last moments. And, and, but she said nothing about Jesus Christ. Just almost the same thing. We had hope in hope. Uh, one of the represent, representatives of the Catholic Church, they basically said the same thing, one after another. And they also had the, 
the Ba'ai, the Ba'ai group, which is a, a cult, they said, I think we would have more to offer than anybody else because, you see, we are in agreement with all of the different faiths. We accept all the different faiths. We have no problem accepting the, the, the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Catholics and the, you know, and, and Buddhists and um, even the Muslims. We, we all believe in the same God. And I think we, we have the best uh, uh, chance to comfort the person because we embrace all faiths. Meaning that they don't embrace anything in particular. And as they were giving their testimony, I knew that it was going to come a time for me to answer. And I thought, Lord, I don't want to be mean. I, I want to be kind. I want to be respectful. I don't want to offend anybody. But if all I'm going to tell the patient who is dying to have hope, to hold on, to hold their hand and maybe say a prayer, if that's all that I can offer, I don't, I'm not really needed. So Lord, help me be able to tell the truth, even though they might sting. And I, and so finally they came to me and said, this is Eusebio Perez, he's the pastor of Royal Baptist Church. Um, Mr. Perez, what would you have to say to a person in that situation? And I looked around the room and I said, I think I would quote John 14, 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody come to the Father but by me. There is no name under heaven given to man by which we can be saved. I just kept my mouth shut. And you would have seen the, the faces of the people. All, almost all, all of them were like, how radical. You know, it, it felt like, and of course, I, I, I could sense the, the room just freezing in that moment. I said, I, I bet you when the, this session is over, nobody's going to, go to want to talk to me. And guess what? The session ended, and all of them just went into a little corner, and it was, I was kind of isolated because I was the bad guy in the room. <laughs> when you say that Jesus Christ is your only hope, that he is not just curious, the, uh, the Lord of Lords, and He is the Jesus, the one that saved, who is the anointed one, and there is no other. You're being very radical. And if you go around telling people that this is the only way, they'll think, well, who do you think you are? All roads lead to heaven. I was told this as a little boy. And I believed it. Then I came across these truths and I thought not all roads lead to heaven, only one road leads to heaven. Mm -hmm. This is why we can have a living hope. Jesus Christ is our only way to heaven. And when things get difficult, folks, when we, when things start, you know, when we start suffering for the cause, of, now, not because of your uh, own stupidity, not only because of the bad decisions we make, we will suffer for that. That's your own fault. But suffering only because you're doing the right thing. And you're wondering, well, if I do the right thing, well, surely God will bless me and uh, protect me and, uh, and send all kind of blessing my way. Well, if you do that and you're persecuted and you're left alone and you're uh, pushed away from society, you know what the Apostle Paul says? Rejoice. You are in good company. You are in the company of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just a prophet. Jesus is not just a teacher. Remember Nicodemus, again, very respectful individual, a man who is not only a tremendous Pharisee, but he was one of the 70. Um, uh, a very, very uh, uh, distinguished individual. If you see Nicodemus walking down the street in, in Jerusalem, people would stop and say to their son, son, that is a man of success. That is a man of God. He was one of the selectors like a bishop in Jerusalem. And when he comes across the Lord Jesus Christ, he calls him teacher. Teacher, we know that you come from God because we, being plural, that is, I and the other Pharisees, we've been talking about you. And we've been checking you out and we see that you are a special individual. We see how God works for you. There's no denial. You cannot deny that you are a good teacher. 
And when he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ one night, Jesus Christ hits him right between the eyes, only to make him understand that he was not just a good teacher, that he is Jesus himself. And there in chapter 3 and verse 16, you know that you know it by memory, he made a very, again, very um, impactful uh, comment. He said, I know, I'm sorry, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he's telling Nicodemus, listen, this is, I'm just not a teacher. I'm God's begotten son. Then he gave himself, and uh, that so, uh, all those who believe in him would, would uh, have everlasting life. And Nicodemus, of course, is blown away by this statement. We, we certainly believe that you are a good teacher. But you are affirming that you are God in the flesh. That must have hit him really hard. Again, think this brings memories to me. I remember as an atheist, now I'm an atheist, I'm about 18 years old. I started, and I, and I wore a cross my, around my neck. It didn't have the image of Christ, but it, it was a nice flashy cross. And I wear it around and I dated this uh, young girl who was also an atheist. And uh, she said, but I thought you were an atheist. I said, I am. You don't believe in God at all? No. You don't believe that, I mean, why are you wearing that cross? As well, although I don't believe that Jesus Christ was God, I, did, I do believe that he was a great philosopher. He was a great teacher, like Gandhi and all those. Listen, if Christ um, truly is, I'm mean, sorry, if, he, if Christ is not God, if Christ is not the Messiah, he was not a good man, he was not a, a good philosopher, he was a liar. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. If Jesus is not who he says he, if he, he was, Jesus was not good. But Jesus um, confirmed who he was by through the resurrection. Nicodemus' life was turned upside down by that fact. And the disciples, uh, the apostles' life were turned upside down by the fact of the resurrection. Remember, when Jesus Christ resurrected, he didn't go to believers, he went to believing unbelievers. They were all hiding, thinking, this is it, it's finished. All our dreams have been shattered. Jesus Christ is not who we thought he was. He's dead. He's not the liberator that we thought he was. Um, he's gone. But then Jesus Christ on the third day resurrected, appeared to his disciples and showed them that even Peter, remember he was in a very special appointment with Peter, said Peter, and he appeared to him and, uh, and he showed him that he was truly who he said all the time that he would be. Remember what happened to Peter? Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Oh Lord, I'll go with you to the end of the, I mean, I'll go to you with, I'll go for you to, even to death. Well, you're going to be denying me three times with the cock, uh, 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 saying three times you, you, you will have denied me three times. I mean, and Peter, of course, did that. <clears throat> denied Jesus Christ three times. Jesus went to the cross. He, he was finished. He was prayed, placed in a, in a tomb. And every time everybody thought, well, that's it. The only thing that we can expect from Christ right now is just him rocking away. But then he resurrected. And the life of Peter, this is, this is where I'm going with this, okay? Please stay with me. This is where Peter's life was turned around when he fully understand that Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ, is truly Kurios, Jesus, the Christos. When he saw Jesus Christ resurrected, remember, before he denied Jesus three times, he, and then he hid like a scared mouse. And then, they, and then on the day of Pentecost, he stood up and he said, Listen, he who was priest of Jesus Christ, he has risen. He's the one that you nailed on the cross. 
But he is risen. He's standing in front of thousands of people, not as a scared mouse, but as a bold lion. And that boldness came from his certainty on who Jesus was. I'm telling you, once you understand the first line in this sentence, everything else will fall in place. But if you don't actually understand this first sentence, nothing will fall in place. So Peter opens up, and we'll get into more into who this Peter is. And you know, I, I, when we want to describe the Apostle Peter, you know why we love him so much? Because he's just like us. If you think about following the, uh, the Apostle Paul, Paul to me is intimidating. If I had him in the same room and I was asked to preach, I, I wouldn't I would know what to say. I would think, you know, possibly the second sentence of everything that I say, he's going to say, uh, not exactly. When you have somebody like Tim who knows Greek and Hebrew and knows so much of the Bible, you kind of feel intimidated, don't you? Yeah. And try to preach in front of somebody like Paul. When you think of, you know, a lawyer who has everything just but right, you know. But with Peter, he's, it's, he's like one of us. He's... He messes up every time he opens his mouth. He's um, unpredictable. He's uh, self-centered. He's and he, you know he's very very much like us. And to see Peter's name in this in this epistle it should be the first thing that strikes us. Peter, can Lord, I'm sure you could have found somebody more successful, a disciple that followed you from the beginning to the end without any flaw. He would be your perfect representative to talk to us about that living hope. No, Jesus said, and Jesus says, no, no, no. I think the best individual is the one that failed most and learned from it. And Peter opens the letter saying, hey folks, I'm Peter, Petros. And by the way, I'm an apostle. And in case you don't know why I'm here, I'm an apostle. Of Jesus and Christus. And he goes into detail. We saw him. We touched his wounds. We spoke to we everything that deals with a physical experience, we had that. We saw the resurrected Christ. But we have a more sure, um, more uh, something more sure, uh, 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 sure way. So in the scriptures, says you have the sure prophecy that you can lean on to, not just your own experience. What I'm trying to convey to you this afternoon is don't miss sentence one and move on. You read First Peter, you have, and if you do it like I did the first time, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the stranger, come on, get into the subject, and you go on, and come on, give me something that I could, I could be blessed with. If you miss the first line, you won't really get the rest. Everything in 1 Peter, and by the way, St. Peter, in all the other epistles, hinges around who Jesus Christ truly is. We've had <clears throat> several sessions in us at the Christian Growth Seminar on Christology. And we saw that, you know, he, Jesus Christ fulfilled all the prophecies. He, he uh, pr provided all, uh, all the credentials. He was the one who he said he was. And the question we'll be studying is, if Jesus Christ didn't, didn't truly resurrect, how would that affect your Christian walk, your Christian life? Let me ask you a question. I want to trick you. How, how many of you would continue being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, just say that he didn't really resurrect. How many of you would say, I would be here every Sunday, I would continue giving testimony, I would continue being a Christian, even though Jesus did not resurrect? I asked that question years ago in a very big church in California. I asked the question, I said, how many, of course I was teaching about Jesus Christ, how wonderful he was, how wonderful his teachings were, and I asked the question, how many of you, if you've learned that Jesus Christ didn't truly resurrect, if that didn't happen, how many of you would still continue being Christian? And several hands went up. They didn't understand. If you go into First Corinthians chapter 15, I think it is, 
where Paul goes into kind of a, a, a game there. He says that Christ didn't resurrect. He kind of sums it up saying we are the, the, all men the most miserable. Let's close the church. Let's make this a bar. This could take anything except the church. And this is, I mean, Christ didn't resurrect. I would throw this Bible away and I would just start thinking, what can I do with my life? I've wasted 43 years of my life. If Christ didn't resurrect. But if Jesus did resurrect, Paul says, we're not of, the, of all men most miserable, we're of all men most blessed of all. And I don't know about you folks, but I believe that Jesus resurrected and all the proof is there. And because Christ is the Jesus, Christus, the resurrected one, we are in safe hands. And Peter is the first best candidate to bring this epistle to us. A man who failed in just every possible way, but then got up and understood that Jesus truly is the resurrected one. And his life for the following 30 years just went up and down like this, all the way to 1 Peter saying, where he came and said, hey folks, if you're going to have hope, you need a good bridge to have to lay on. Don't just have hope in hope. Have hope in Christ the resurrected one. Let's all stand and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, we didn't go very much into this epistle. We, I tried to hammer this truth that Jesus is truly the Jesus Christus, the Curios, the, the Lord, Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the resurrected one, the Son of God, the anointed one. He's the one that we are here representing. And because he is a living Savior, Lord, we have, we are the, of all men and women most blessed. And we have a reason to live and we have a purpose to live for. And it is not just only to bring up our families and try to um, make, make ends meet. The true reason why we are left behind is, is again, that there in verse 2. We all come from different parts of the world and we're not here by accident. We are like scattered seeds placed here for a specific purpose to continue announcing the riches of the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation that is only in Him. We are your ambassadors, Father. You have made us priests and kings. Uh, and Lord, we are here to represent you. Help us not forget that. When times get busy, when urgency seems to be knocking at our door at all times, help us never forget of the important things that you've called us to do. We have to have fellowship with you every day. We have to remember that we are here to share the gospel with all those who lend us their ear to listen. We are here Lord, to worship you, to serve you. If you are truly the Kurios, Jesus, Christus, then the only acceptable answer that we can give you, Lord, is obedience, is total surrender. And so, Father, as we get into this epistle, help us understand this first line. We can't miss it. It's all in capital letters. This faith statement, this declaration of faith, every time we say that Jesus is the only way, the only name given by God under heaven by which we can be saved. Every time we say Jesus Christus, we're saying that only Jesus is the way to heaven. He is the truth, the way, and the life, and no one can come to you except through him. Help us to <laughs> nail that in well so that we can understand that we can respond to all the other challenges that are that come our way. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.